thanks. I just echo um, Lois's thanks uh, that you're all here today. We also especially appreciate the opportunity to partner with um, Dr. Sakana, Lois, and um, their office uh, with this event. It certainly would not have been possible without their event. So Citizens Acting for Rail Safety is an all-volunteer group, citizen group, that uh, merged um, 2015, um, in part in reaction to the event of Black Mountain Beach where the rail disaster happened. Um, in the groups around the country were coming together, and a group here hosted a memorial, um, and that's where a few of us met for the very first time. And shortly after that, we had the opportunity to connect with a group in La Crosse, Wisconsin, that was called Citizens Acting for Rail Safety, and Kathy and I, um, we have a lot of Kathy's in our group. Um, Kathy and I went down and met with the folks there that had already been working on how to um, address concerns they had around an expansion of rail and hazardous uh, oil trains as well as other hazardous materials coming through their community and, and across in, in that area. Um, very shortly after that, we were just thrown right into, there was a series of, of derailments that were very visible right in a, in a row, and the, suddenly the media wanted that citizen voice. And so we suddenly, after having just one meeting, I think, one community meeting, were asked to, um, to bring that voice to the, to the public, to respond to these issues. And so we've really become that, um, that role, played that role in being able, in the midst of these very technical issues, sometimes, sometimes very political issues, to continue to be that, that citizen voice. Because we're the ones living often in the areas right near the railroad tracks, uh, the ones dealing with the risk and being aware of the risk. That, um, that railroad track, as we've often said, while it also while it brings the risks, it's also connected us. And so we have not only the connection to lacrosse, there's also a citizen acting for rail safety group now in Milwaukee. And then nationally, there's a group that's been built up, actually, I keep saying nationally, it's actually North American as a whole, it's Canada and the United States, that has um, groups all over North America that are addressing rail safety issues. And the group's called a crude awakening network. Um, and so we've been fortunate to be part of conference calls, perhaps every month or so, connecting us. Um, Claire and I were able to uh, go to Pittsburgh to a conference there, to connect with other activists around the country. So this, what is happening here today, is just um, is an opportunity for us to continue to learn. I think that's one of the first things that we've done as, as citizens is to learn and educate ourselves and do kind of really important citizen research into what. Um, is happening around these issues, as well as to build community engagement and speak to policy concerns, often at the state legislature, but to also within city government. And we had an opportunity today uh, with Dr. General to go to the city of Minneapolis and speak with a few folks there in the city of St. Paul. So we're excited to have that opportunity. Um, the one thing I wanted to make sure I did is have all of the folks from the CARS leadership team stand up. So if you've attended any of our leadership team meetings, please stand up, all of these folks. Um, and just talk to all of the lots of research, um, lots of community make communication, help get this event going as well as Lois and her staff. Um, I'm just, I'll turn it back to, I guess it's Dr. Chiscon who's gonna do the introductions. Um, this, what I've been really excited in, in hearing the conversations today is how important community all of this to resiliency and not just this particular form of risk but all the risks that we face and so how appropriate that we're together as a community. And if you want to join us you're signed up so you'll hear about things um, as they're as we have new opportunities. Thanks to everybody from CARS. I'm Bill Toscano from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and one of our great interests is how do people resilient after an event that occurs in their lives? And an investigator at the Minnesota named uh, Bruce uh, something, invented a, a concept called allostatic load. And allostatic load tells you how fast you can recover or how slowly you can recover. And this is he had applied to, to individuals, but also communities suffer this as well. When we were living in New Orleans. They went through the Katrina effect and so on, and the Gulf Coast, the oil spills. We were seeing these kinds of effects. So this is one of our great interests, and our funders, the National Institutes of Health, uh, wanted us to do a resilience pro project. And lo and behold, Carnes Group was here, and uh, Ed Lear, one of our instructors, thought of this as a good idea to worry about the Bakken oil trains. 
which I really never had thought about because they didn't get clean through my neighborhood. <laughs> so when we step down from the male building and outside, we, we actually see these things going on. And then we met uh, Dr. Ginero in Detroit. Uh, she gave a talk on resilience, and, and I was very impressed by her work. And I think that she's doing outstanding research and, and practical public health in the area of resilience with the community. And so she's a professor at the Sherbrooke University in Canada. I was always going to say Sherbrooke. <laughs> <laughs> And so it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. General. I think you will enjoy her talk. OK, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you for inviting me. That's very exciting. Uh, you know, I appreciate every time I get the opportunity to share this very unique story. And I think we've been learning a lot these past five years. So that's really my pleasure to share about our lessons learned and what we've been doing, doing over there. And. Um, Okay, so I'm an associate professor, yeah, and but I'm also the public health director in my region. So you need to know that in the province of Quebec, we do have 18 health regions, and for each of these regions, we have a public health director, which needs to be a public, uh, public health physician as well. So I'm a physician, a public health specialist, and um, one thing that's quite particular in my situation is that I, I was nominated on July 2nd, 2013, so if you remember the date of the derailment, it was four days after my nomination, so on July 6, 2013. So that was so unthinkable that at the beginning I thought it was kind of a joke or, you know, I just couldn't believe it when they called me at maybe 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. But then I quickly realized, of course, that it was not a joke. And uh, when they called me, they just told me, like, Melissa, half of the city is burning, and there's a train, and there's some chemicals, but we don't know yet which chemicals are involved. So that's how I was informed at the very, very beginning. And as uh, William said, today, um, of course, we're going to start from the beginning, how, just to make sure that we're, you're all aware of the details, like what happened exactly, what chemicals were involved and so on. But I'm going to move quite quickly to the long-term impacts, because I think that what one of the things that we've been doing that was a little bit beyond what's normally expected from a public health uh, organization is the long-term response to the, the community that we uh, offer. So I hope you're going to enjoy <coughs> the presentation. And uh, I was thinking about that, but what do you think of uh, asking questions as we go along the presentation? I think it's going to be more interactive this way. Okay, so if you want me to provide more details about some specific aspects, of course, feel free to ask as we go along. And of course, I'm not going to name them all, but uh, I have some uh, uh, a problem. Sometimes I, I say I, 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 I did this and this, but I, I didn't do everything. Of course, that's obvious. We have a whole team, a public health team. We have researchers uh, from uh, several universities. We have the citizens that were so helpful and like community organizations and even the ministry. You're going to see the ministry at the provincial level was very helpful. So that kind of things that still happen um, to be true sometimes. And uh, the Canadian Red Cross. So as uh, I said, we're going to look at the impacts of the lac megantic in the short term and the longer term. I'm talking, of course, of public health impacts. Then I'm going to try to describe uh, overall, like the public health response in the short and the longer term to these disasters. And most importantly, we're going to try to identify the main lessons learned that I want you to remember and take with you if you ever have to deal with a disaster. So this is a beautiful town of Lac Megantic, and at least who uh, there's Chris, Christian who has been in Lac Megantic, <laughs> uh, but I guess you're the only one, yeah? No? Yeah, okay. And me, of course, uh, a couple of times. Uh, so this is the beautiful town of Lac Megantic, and the reason why I'm showing this picture is that uh, you need to remember that Lac Megantic used to be a very peaceful place, a rural town of roughly 6,000 residents, quite a small place, but still it is the seat of the granite area. So in my big region, we do have seven areas, including the granite area. And in the granite, we have about 20,000 people, and Lac Megantic is really at the heart of the granite. So it's a small place, but still the central place of 
the Greenwich area. And we have a beautiful lake, nature, parks everywhere, mountains, so it's such a nice place to be. But as you can imagine, this place has a, been a little bit modified, this landscape after the disaster. So as you all know, I guess, in the middle of the night of July 6th, so all of this happened at around 1, uh, 15 past 1 a.m., there was uh, this train, uh, the Montreal Main and Atlantic train, carrying, as you all know, back, back in oil uh, from North Dakota, uh, very inflammable oil, like wood oil. So we had 72 car trains that were booked onto the engine. And I'm not going to give all the details because it's not really the purpose of the presentation, but uh, if you want to find more information, it's quite easy on the web. And I think that I have some, a lot of people in the room that are even more expert than I am on this uh, specific question. But for a, a series of, of reasons, uh, we had this train that was left with no engineer at the control at the top of a hill about seven, seven miles away from downtown Lake Megantic. And this was like a usual practice in Lake Megantic. It has been the case for several years. So, uh, so for other reasons, the brakes just went down and the train just began rolling out from the village of Nantes towards Lake Megantic. And because of the downhill slope, the train accelerated its descent, reaching, I think, 65 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. And on the top of that, you know, at the end of the, the downhill slope, there was a sharp curve located right in the middle of downtown Lake Megantse. So as you can imagine, the train derailed and uh, the car trains uh, ruptured and escaping oil was responsible for a series of explosions. In fact, uh, about 60 explosions in a row and a major conflagration. And it's a little bit small, but you can see here on the picture that how the car trains uh, the, the train cars ended their trajectory, kind of uh, sandwiched one against another, and you can also see the damage directly caused, got, caused by the fire. So overall, the tragedy was responsible for 47 deaths, and you need to remember that we're talking about a 6,000 people city. So if you apply this proportion to Minneapolis, about one person it would mean maybe 4,000 deaths. Okay, so it was not only people leaving, uh, living in the downtown area, but also people that were just having fun at bars uh, because it was in the middle of the night. There's also 27 children that were left or framed because many young adults did, uh, died that night. Many buildings that destroyed. A third of the local population that was evacuated. And of course, a major environmental contamination with six million liters of oil that was spilled all over the place. So I'm just going to show some more pictures. Uh, so this one is taken from uh, a government, federal government. So you can see like the, the huge fire. And this uh, dark plum uh, began in the middle of the night and remained visible through the night and the next day. So this was a major public health issue at the beginning, of course. Um, you can see how devastated the neighborhoods were. And I'm going to show you some pictures that I personally took in the days following the disaster. So this is the kind of uh, things that we were observing, like some intact buildings. And just beside, you can see that there is nothing left. So there was like this huge fireballs. And if you were located in this trajectory, it was too bad for you or for the building. Same thing with the garbage. You can see the effect of the, the heat and the fire. Mm. Well, these are not the best pictures, but I took it. Took it so. mm. And then the oil spill. So I think it's one of the worst environmental catastrophe that we had in Canada, for sure. So as I told you, we're talking about 72 car trains. Each of them had a capacity of about 100,000 liters of light crude oil, which is an enormous amount of crude oil. And overall, it's uh, 63 car trains who derailed. Most of them lost their contents. So at the end, we have an estimated 6 million uh, liters of crude oil, uh, most of which caught a fire uh, or seeped into the soil. But we still have about 100,000 liters of oil that into the waters of the Lake Megantic and the river, uh, Shodian River. 
So I know that you're making some relationships with your situation with the Mississippi River, so that kind of stuff can happen. And, of course, the worst uh, aspect of this disaster is the many deaths that, were, that occurred. Uh, so on the, the picture at the top, uh, it's a little bit small, sorry, but you can see a small red circle. Mm -hmm. So this corresponds to the Musique Café. Music Café, have you heard a little bit about this? No, okay, so Music Café was like the coolest place to be uh, downtown. It's a very popular place, the small bar. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many, it, it was not full, but many people were still over there at 1 a.m., which is completely normal. Um, so 27 out of the 47 people who died that night were located inside the Music Café. So unfortunately for those who just decided to stay inside because there was very good music, there was a band and all of this, they, 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 they were not lucky enough to see coming the, the train and they couldn't escape. Yeah. You mentioned the oil seepage into the ground and the spill into the lake and the river. My question is, what is the source of water for the town? Do people have individual private wells or is there a municipal water supply? And if there was a municipal water plant, um, it's something we haven't heard much about. You know, how was that affected by the oil contamination? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Uh, that's one of the, the risk assessment parts that we conducted uh, as the public health uh, authority over there. Um, so we're talking about not private wells. Some people a little bit farther from the center are using our own private wells, but you need to know that most of the people in Lake Megantic are serviced by municipal artesian wells. And we were pretty lucky about that because the artesian wells were located a little bit further away. And because of the geology aspects, I'm not an expert in it, but we've been told that it was merely impossible that the contamination into the soil would reach the, the, the underground water. So this is a one good thing. And of course, we did several tests just to make sure that it was really the case. And we've been monitoring the water for several months and everything was okay. The other issue, of course, was um, the contam direct contamination into the water system network. but. Um, you know, I'm always learning about Lake Megantic when I have a discussion with people over there. And uh, recently, somebody told me how heroic were the municipal workers that night. <coughs> One of them, it, maybe it was not a very good idea, but anyway, he had the, the, the he just decided to go down in the, when he saw the fire and said, oh my God, I need to uh, close, not close, but uh, turn off. Yeah, turn off the, the the, the water system so that the contamination is not going to be all over the place. So he did it very quickly and thanks to him, um, the, he saved the, the, the water system. Mm -hmm. Yeah? The previous slide had flames coming out of what looked like a manhole in the street. Yeah, so that's the kind of... Uh, uh, that one, you had that multiple slide, but the first one, yeah, right in the middle there where it's covered over now, mm -hmm. there was a picture of a street with flames just Oh, yeah. Right there. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I didn't take this picture. Hmm. It looks like a yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, it caught fire, but um, it seems they just uh, not uh, they just uh, put the valves so that it didn't uh, disseminate it into the whole water system. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, but of course, uh, right the in the... oil got down into the sewer system? Yeah, it did, but very centrally, <laughs> and they just... Uh, so yeah. the only part that was affected was the part that was already evacuated anyway, because people were located much too close to the disaster site. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding the waters of the Megantic Lake, uh, I didn't see that because I arrived a little bit later, but it seems that like the, the oil just went from the train to the lake, which maybe there's a couple of meters, I think it's a to say, less than 100 meters, I would say, I'm not sure. So the oil just went right into the lake and it was on fire, so it looked like very impressive. And people that, some people that I know just decided to escape using their boat and to go in the middle of the lake, middle, maybe not the middle, because the lake is huge, but they told me, feeling the heat and then the water was hot and moody, so they felt like they would melt, you know, but Okay. 
Okay, so, and that's really important to know that the coroner's, uh, no, the coroner that uh, was involved in this uh, file uh, qualified the 47 bill as violent and avoidable. And that's very important, you know, because th that seems obvious, but uh, I think it was really helpful and that's one of the arguments to say that we need to learn from that and make sure that it's never going to happen again. And you can see all the young um, people, young adults, because most of them were just having fun at the bar. Okay, I'm not going to go to, uh, I'm not an expert of the rail safety per se, like, you know, I'm on the public health side, but just to let you know if you're not aware of this report, that this report exists. So this is the first thing, and you're going to be, you're going to find it quite easily on the web. So just to let you know that the Transportation Safety Board of Canada, which is like the, the, the federal authority who was in charge of the investigation of why all of this happened, um, maybe one year following the disaster, they released this report. And the main conclusion was that there is no single cause to this tragedy. So there's a series of explanations and of factors which are all illustrated around the circle. So each of these factors contributed to the lac megantic accident. Yeah? Why was this enormous train in this little city? And you don't have a port, there wasn't a, a tank car port. And it was a little railroad that didn't run to North Dakota, obviously. Why did it have control of these cars? I mean, how did this little, big train get to the, were they hiding it? <laughs> oh no, it's just a, it's a, a route toward New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. So it's just that it happens that like Megantic has uh, developed around the railway. So the, the authorities were very proud of the railway and so they, they developed because of it. Uh, I don't know how to translate it in English and it's feasible, but the, the, the team of the city, it's written on each of their map, is uh, from the railroad to the sky, something like that, because they have a two great pride, or they used to have two uh, pride, so the railroad and the sky because of the stars, because we have a magnificent, magnificent sky uh, observation of it. Anyway, so that's kind of weird, you know, when I saw this this on July 6th from, yeah, from the railroad road to the sky. And so I think that, that, that's the reason why it became like Megantic. So in, in, of course, but with historically, we were not talking about crude oil. We were talking about, you know, transportation of several the different products, but as we all know, as a society, our dependency to petrol and oil just came higher and higher. Where could they ship? Where could they load that oil onto a ship? Where can they? Refineries. refineries. What's the oh, refineries? Oh, yeah, you are uh, urban oil in New Brunswick. That's what I think. Yeah. Which That's the port. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's the largest refinery in Canada. It's in St. John. So just to clarify, this train was was hauling North Dakota Wagner oil and had originated in North Dakota. That train had actually traveled through Minneapolis, and there are a couple of route options. But in this case, the train goes into Canada and then making its way to the refinery, and it just so happens that that route takes it through Lac Megantic. And don't they have to switch rail carriers at the international border, Claire? Somebody has the answer, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I can kind of answer briefly. Traveled by a Canadian Pacific to Montreal and then the short line railroad, the NMA, took it over from uh, Montreal and, and mm -hmm. take it to the uh, U.S. Uh, Quebec border for mm -hmm. the U.S. So it, that was the primary reason this was in such terrible shape. Was that, was that, Third grade railroad with a lot of dis disinvestment applied to it over the years. Totally vulnerable to this kind of derailment. Mm -hmm. And it's still circulating in like Megalsic, by the way. I'm yeah. going to come back to this aspect, but that's the most uh, surprising part. So we didn't change anything yet. Mm -hmm. I'll come back on this aspect. Because <laughs> some people in like Megalsic are not really happy about this. So to come back to the public health response and more overall, generally speaking, the disaster management, 
uh, just to let you know that we can divide it into two major phases, which corresponds to emergency response operations and, of course, recovery operations. And you need to know that regarding recovery operations, I'm talking about the first months and years, but never at the very beginning, I thought that we would still still be involved that much. So I'm still working uh, as much as I did two, three years ago, and maybe a little bit more, because we're getting more and more more involved into several projects and in initiatives. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later. So I really like this uh, figure from an American document, uh, like, I think it's your FEMA. Yeah, from FEMA. But that's exactly what they're saying. And you need to be prepared for the years following such a, a disaster. And just knowing that at the beginning would have been helpful. Because in my mind, from a protocol perspective, I thought that my job would be mostly in the first few days, maybe weeks, maybe months, you know, for monitoring health impacts. But never I thought that I would still be involved five years later. And now I know that I'm still going to be involved for another five years, maybe more. So let's talk very quickly about the first days and weeks, but I'm not going to go too uh, deeply into the public health response. I, we could talk about this for hours, but as I told you, I think it's really important to look at the long-term response, which is a little bit more innovative and unique, unique to me. But overall, you need to know that in my mind and the, the, in the mind of the whole public health team, at the very beginning, we were looking at you know, physical health impacts. So impacts that would be related to clinical hazards, physical hazards, because we had to deal at the same time with a heat wave, putting additional stress to uh, first responders. Um, we had to deal with risk of injuries, building collapse, and biological hazards, because as I told you, we had to deal with the water main break. So because of that, we had the preventive uh, water boil advisory, advisory. We also had to deal with, of course, power outage, so potential food contamination. But the, the principal hazards, of course, were chemical hazards with the toxic cloud, the soot fallout, oil vapors, dust, oil spill. So a lot of risk assessment and risk management to do. And of course, risk communication. Um, so we have published a paper uh, on the public health response in the first few months and years. So we could find much more details about the public health response, but I'm going to give a little, some details about the risk assessment and evacuation, which were like two, the two main components of our public health response. So risk assessment, very quickly, I'm not going to go into details, but just to let you know that in the face of such a complex situation, we didn't have to assess only one type of risk. We had to deal with many risks at the same time for the general <coughs> population, the Lac Megantic population, but also the, the wider community around Lac Megantic, uh, given the, the, the water, the private wells, you know, the, we had so many questions, like for example, uh, the soot fallout, uh, much that occurred much harder than in downtown Lac Megantic, can it, is it dangerous for the wells, the, the private wells, can it, is it possible that the water is contaminated? So we have to answer to all of these questions. Can we swim? Can we fish? Can we, Whatever, whatever. Then we had to evaluate the risk for first responders and all the workers on site. We had to deal with uh, air quality, water quality, recreational water, um, drinkable water quality, soil. So a lot, a lot of work to do. And we had to deal, and maybe that's the most important thing to remember, with many partners on site. So each of them had access to different types of information that was required to conduct our risk assessment. But we didn't know each other that much. So they, they just didn't know that their information was very useful to my risk assessment. You know, So all these relationships and learning each uh, from each other and our, our respective roles and resp responsibility was a, quite a challenge at the beginning. And finally, and most importantly, we had a tremendous difficulty accessing the data to uh, the formal documents that would prove the content of the cars. And I swear that even after a few weeks, I didn't have access to these formal documents. So there was a lot of rumors um, about potentially uh, potential arsenic that would be that come present in the, the, the car train the train cars. 
uh, some kind of uh, similar rumors, but without knowing what was in the cars, how do you want me to look at the right contaminants in the water, in the air? So, so that was a real issue. And I just learned something. When you're dealing with a criminal investigation and the protection of the public, the, the protection of the public health, criminal investigation wins over public health. <laughs> Yeah, and that's hard to hear, but I've been talking to the highest uh, position person, lawyer in Quebec, and he told me that he was sorry, but it wasn't possible to share the documents since it, it, it was used as a proof for the criminal investigation on, uh, ongoing. Who paid for all this? Did the federal government, your province, Quebec, pay for this? Uh, all of this, all of this. <laughs> Were there large fights and, and you know, uh, that's a complicated question because, uh, of course, the, the, the question is who's guilty. So, it, it, so uh, the Fed level, uh, of course, gave a lot of money. The provincial level contributed as well. But the main issue is the Montreal Main and Atlantic uh, Company train, which uh, declared bankruptcy a couple of weeks after, something like that. So it was a little bit harder finding some financial support from them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, they, they gave money, but I, I think that they're still, you know, trying to find out a way to get back the money, but it has never been like an issue. Uh, honestly, when I was underground, never I heard something like, oh no, don't spend too much, uh, you know, at least in the short term. But in the longer term, I'm gonna come back because it was a little bit harder to get the additional resources needed. In, in the data, there was two suicides. Is yes. this something unusual or unexpected in this type of a disaster? Oh, we had more than two suicides, but these two suicides were absolutely directly related to the disaster. So one of them was the one of the two musicians at the music cafe. He was a survivor, and his colleague died, so he felt guilty. And you know, so and one of the problem with not the problem, but an issue with this person is that he was not living in Lac Mégantic. He was living in Quebec City. So we realized afterward that. He, you know, he went back to his place and maybe he didn't get the support, psychosocial support he should have received. And the second suicide was among a firefighter who was a, a volunteer, a local volunteering firefighters who was involved into body finding and I think he saw a lot of uh, cl close relatives and so something horrible and he just wrote a letter about, you know, the, the reason why he committed suicide. Yeah. But we had other suicides. Like last year, it was very hard. But in high school, which is quite unusual, we had a suicide in the. Okay, it's not the same thing for you. He was 14 years old. That's that's pretty young. Yeah, and it was not specifically related. But at the same time, what we what we realized is that he didn't have any <coughs> risk factor. Or any, didn't have any specific reason for doing this. And what we realized afterward is that after the suicide, the whole community of students were, were so affected by the suicide, like much more than what we would expect. So we had a lot of uh, suicidal uh, ideation after that. So yeah, we feel that the community needs a lot of support. Mm -hmm. Still needs a lot of support. I'll go back to mental health and tax done a lot of uh, studies over there, so I think it's going to answer a little bit more to your questions. So very quickly regarding evacuation, just to let you know that uh, I'm not sure it's the case in the United States, but in, in my, at least in Quebec, uh, I was in charge of deciding whether we should evacuate or not, not our whole neighborhood. So you need to know that the first initial evacuation was ordered by the firefighters because people were just residing much were too close to the disaster site, so it was done for safety reasons. Then we received the first um, data, so TAGA means uh, like a mobile laboratory taking air quality uh, data samples. So they, they, it was pretty, it went pretty good. So they, 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 uh, we knew each other before the disaster, so they knew that 
that kind of information was vital for me to take the right decision. So by 10 a.m., I, I was able to receive by phone the first results, and I remember taking my handwritten note and looking at the results. So we were talking about like polycyclic aromatic uh, hydrocarbons uh, reaching levels of 4,000 nanograms per uh, cubic meters, so very high levels, or very high levels of uh, nitrogen oxides and total suspended particles. So, you know, I wasn't sure should we order the evacuation in this neighborhood or not, because the neighborhood um, was located <coughs> downwind of the disaster site, but uh, quite removed, removed from the disaster site, so it was not evacuated up to that point, but it was located just under the toxic cloud. And we were talking about 1,000 residents, including uh, senior resi uh, residents for seniors with cognitive problems. So we knew that evacuation wouldn't be that easy. But we decided to proceed to the evacuation with the collaboration of firefighters, of course, for three reasons. So the uh, very high level of chemicals that were found. Um, also, the fact that we knew that the fire would probably last at least two days. And most importantly, the fact that it was not reasonable to think that people would accept sheltering, shelter in place. Because, you know, their, their community was on fire and they were very, uh, wor they were worrying for their relatives and, you know, who's, where is my father, my daughter, my, my, my brother? So people were all around the place in the streets and they were not thinking about their health. It was not their main concern. So for all of these reasons, we ordered the evacuation of the whole neighborhood. And I think it was the right decision to, to take. So you, know, you can see the, the type of results that we received by the end of the day. And I think that such results uh, prove again that it was the right thing to do. Thank you.